Welcome back to Introduction to Logic. This is Module 5, and here we begin a three-module study on propositional logic. Once again, I want to give credit to philosopher James Feaster's Open Education resource that he has made available online for his own courses, and from his logic course, I've taken much material for developing many modules in this course. So let's get started. We are focusing on deductive logic for the next several modules. And recall when we looked at the history of logic briefly in module one, we found that once we get to the 1800s, we have the algebraic period. And moving from the 1800s into the 1900s, symbolic logic became the new approach to modern logic. And with symbolic logic, philosophers could take lengthy propositions and convert them into a symbolic form so that we see less of the language and we're less likely to get caught up in those problems of definition and ambiguity. And instead, the language has been converted into what looks and functions more like a mathematical form. And so in this sense, it's simplified and we can focus more on the operators. When you think about a mathematical equation, you're really focusing on those logical operators, the plus and the minus and the equals, things like this. Well, when we can take all of our language and convert it down to variables and logical operators, it can simplify things to a great extent so that we can focus on the actual logical moves in order to determine if we have valid arguments or invalid arguments. So these logical operators or connectives are key, and so we should start by familiarizing ourselves with the symbols. Logical connectives, also called logical operators, are the symbols or words used to connect two or more sentences, such that the value of the compound sentence produced depends only on that of the original sentences and on the meaning of the connective. There are five common logical connectives, and, or, not, or negation, if, then, and if, and only if. In formal logic, these connectives are symbolized. Now there are a number of symbols that we might see, so to avoid confusion, please understand that symbols can be represented in a few different ways. So I want to bring your attention to some of these different symbols, but I will also emphasize which ones we will use in this course. If you have two things that must be taken together, they are conjoined, then we have a conjunction, and we represent this with some form of an AND symbol. Now, there are a number of symbols that can be used to represent conjunction. We will use an ampersand in this course. However, it will serve you well to understand that it is not uncommon to see AND represented with a caret symbol, an upside-down V, or as a middle dot, or an interpunct, which we often use for multiplication in algebra. A disjunction comes in the form this or that, and it is often represented with either a plus sign, a V, or two parallel lines. We will use in here, and most people use in logic, the V. Now what may be one of the most confusing things about logical symbolization is the fact that it is a plus sign that is used for disjunction, whereas we tend to think addition to be an and. I have this and I have this. So that's addition, right? On the contrary, you will notice that conjunction can use the mathematical symbol that stands for multiplication. So if this is a question that understandably bothers you, then it might be helpful to think of multiplication in terms of repeated addition. Repeated addition would be like thinking of eight as two and two and two and two. So eight apples might be represented as four sets of two apples. So eight is like having four and two. That four and two have to be together in sets. To get eight, you could have two sets of four, or you could have four sets of two. 
but you have to think in sets and you have to have both taken together. So they're conjoined. It's a conjunction. Two and four together, two sets of four or four sets of two can give us eight. This is not the case with two plus four. If you understand then that conjunction in mathematical terms is connected to multiplication and this idea of sets, then thinking of zero as negation, it might help to realize if you have four and zero, that's the same as saying, I have four sets of nothing, which of course is nothing. I have nothing four times. That's not going to give me anything. Or I have four nothing times or zero times. I have to have four at least once in order to have four. If I have four zero times, then I have nothing. This is not the case if I have four plus zero. In this case, I have nothing or I have four things. Now you do not have to fully understand the connection to mathematics in order to understand logic. If you want to go deeper into this question, consult a mathematician, but at a superficial level, this at least makes a little sense that a conjunction is like two things that can't be removed. In the case of x, y, or x times y, I have two things that cannot be broken apart. They have to be taken together. Otherwise, I have a completely different answer. In the case of x plus y, I can deal with x individually, and I can deal with y individually. This is just for your information in case the question was bothering you as it once did me. The main thing you have to know for this course is that we will use the ampersand for and and the symbol that looks like a V for or. Next is negation. There are a few ways to symbolize this. Most commonly is either what's called the negation symbol or a tilde. In this course, we will use a tilde. A conditional or if-then statement is represented with a right arrow, but it may also show up in the form of a horseshoe symbol. Additionally, because it might be easier on a computer, you might occasionally see a right arrow without a stem, so it looks like a right-facing carrot symbol. So if you see that, that just means right-facing arrow and we will use a full right-facing arrow in this course. Finally, there's the if and only if, or the biconditional. This is a double-sided arrow, or an arrow that is pointing both left and right. That's the most common form, though it may also show up in the form of three vertically stacked horizontal lines. Now those are the five logical operators, but you will also want to know after moving from the premises to the conclusion, the symbol that is used to signal the conclusion, or a therefore symbol. And there are two main types, either a turnstile symbol or three dots forming a triangle. Okay, so let's look at each one a little more closely. First, the conjunction. In a conjunction, the sentence letters are called conjuncts. For example, P and Q, P is a conjunct. The two conjuncts can be reversed and retain the original meaning. P and Q means the same thing as Q and P, just like two times four and four times two mean the same. In ordinary conversation, several words can express the conjunctive relation, such as but, although, besides, and of course, and, in a disjunction, the sentence letters are called disjuncts. In this case, the two disjuncts can be reversed and also retain the original meaning. P or Q is the same as Q or P. Just as four plus two and two plus four can mean the same thing. The disjunction is always understood inclusively. This is important. The disjunction is always understood inclusively as meaning or and. As you should recall, we discussed this in module three. When you have an or statement like P or Q, it could be the case that only P obtains, or it could be the case that only Q is true, but it could also be the case that P and Q are both true, 
The only information we have, however, is that P is true or Q is true. So let P stand for I have a dog and let Q stand for I have a cat. I have a dog or I have a cat. If I have a dog but no cat, P is true. If I have a cat but no dog, Q is true. Yet if I have a cat and a dog, then P or Q, P is true. P or Q, Q is true. Notice that if I have both, it can still be true that I have one or I have the other. It cannot be the case that I have either one or the other if I have both. So the disjunction is not stressing an either or, but simply that we have reason to believe that this could be the case or that could be the case. So P might obtain, Q might obtain, or both P and Q might obtain. So the disjunction is never to be taken as exclusive where either P obtains or Q obtains, but both cannot obtain. Keep that in mind. If P stands for proposition P is true, when you see negation symbol P, you should read this as it is not the case that P. For conditional, such as if P then Q, or P right arrow Q, the first sentence letter is called the antecedent. P is the antecedent. The second, Q, is called the consequent. So if the antecedent is true, then the consequent will follow as a consequence. The antecedent and the consequent cannot be reversed and still retain its original meaning. If Q then P is not the same thing as if P then Q. In ordinary conversation, several words express the conditional relationship, such as this implies that, or this entails that, or since this is the case then, or of course, if this is the case then. Now there are two common ways of designating conditional statements. One approach is to stress the necessary and sufficient conditions surrounding a situation. Since this is the case, this follows. And the other approach is to use the language of if or only if. In one sense, the first sense, we are speaking in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions. In this case, the P is the sufficient condition, the antecedent is the sufficient condition, and the Q, or the consequent, is the necessary condition. For example, if it rains, the sidewalk will get wet. In this case, P is sufficient for Q. Raining is a sufficient condition for the sidewalk being wet. Now, while P is sufficient to bring about Q, it is not the only possible reason that Q could come about. The sidewalk could also get wet if the gardener sprayed it with a gardening hose or if the sprinklers were on. In other words, Q, the consequent, does not mean that P necessarily had to be the case in order for Q to obtain. Yet P is a sufficient reason for Q. If the sidewalk is wet, rain is a good explanation. If it is raining, the sidewalk will be wet. However, it is also possible if the sidewalk is wet that something else led to that consequence. Q is a necessary condition for P. The sidewalk will be wet if it rains. That's a necessary result or consequence. So in any and every situation in which P arises as the antecedent, Q will follow as a necessary consequence. Yet this does not mean that P is necessary for Q to obtain. Rain is not necessary for a sidewalk to get wet, but if it does rain, the sidewalk will get wet. Now we have to be careful to lock onto the language of if and the language of only if. Consider the following conditional statement as worded in a standard propositional form. Let R stand for it rains. Let S stand for the sidewalk gets wet. If it rains, if R, then the sidewalk will get wet, then S. So R, right arrow, S. Now, in our ordinary conversation, this might show up in two ways. The sidewalk will get wet if it rains. Or, it is raining only if the sidewalk gets wet. So in one case, we have S, if R, or 
R leads to S, or if R then S. But in the other case, we have R only if S, and we have to treat that a little different. While the terms if and only if both indicate some sort of conditional relationship in our ordinary conversation, they do not mean the same thing. And in logic, they actually designate opposite orders of the antecedent and consequent. When the term if appears by itself in a sentence, that is without the word only attached, we should follow our normal intuition and interpret if as designating the antecedent. So something is the case if something else is the case. In this case, if by itself signals the antecedent. So that tells us that whatever follows after if is going to be our P. Even if in our normal conversation, it shows up in a backwards order. Consequence is the case if antecedent is the case. So we would translate this to if P then Q or P right over Q and the P is whatever showed up in the sentence after the if. If by itself always designates that what comes next is the antecedent. However, when the phrase only if appears in the sentence, it does not designate the antecedent. It designates the consequent. Think of the term only if as stressing the necessity of the consequent. So we still end up with P right arrow Q, but in this case, whatever came after only if, that is the Q and not the P. Now speaking of only if, we have to be careful when we hear that language because if we ever see if and only if taken together, this signals a biconditional rather than a regular conditional. The regular conditional comes in the form if P then Q or P right arrow Q. The biconditional comes in the form of a double arrow P and Q with an arrow pointing both to P and to Q. So the biconditional combines a conditional relationship between P and Q and its reverse. Sentence letters are called biconditions because the two terms can be reversed and still retain the original meaning. Now remember we said in the case of a conditional, if P then Q does not mean if Q then P. Well, in the case of a biconditional, that is the case. The biconditional signals that if P is the case, then Q is the case, and necessarily, if Q is the case, then P is the case. In other words, P biconditional Q is the same as writing P right arrow Q and Q right arrow P. So P is a necessary and sufficient condition for Q. For example, Bob is a bachelor. Bob's being a bachelor is both necessary and sufficient for Bob being an unmarried man. If Bob is the bachelor, then Bob is an unmarried man. If Bob is an unmarried man, then Bob is a bachelor. So in this example, P is a sufficient condition for Q. Bob's being a bachelor is enough to conclude that Bob is an unmarried man. P is also a necessary condition for Q. By definition, if Bob is a bachelor, he must be an unmarried man. So we could say P if and only if Q. Bob is a bachelor if and only if Bob is an unmarried man. Now notice by saying P if and only if, we're saying P if Q, so the if signals that Q is an antecedent, and we're also saying only if Q, signaling that Q is a consequent. So if you understand the language we've already clarified with the if and the only if, then you should see that P if and only if Q tells us both P if Q, that is Q right arrow P, and P only if Q, that is P right arrow Q. Both are taken together. So we end up with P right arrow Q and Q right arrow P, a biconditional. Okay, now let's talk about truth tables. Remember Ludwig Wittgenstein from Module 1 and Module 4? Well, Wittgenstein is credited with creating 
what is called a truth table. A truth table is a diagram presented in rows and columns that shows all the possible combinations of truth values for the given variables within a given proposition so that we may easily evaluate the proposition's overall validity. Now when we talk about truth tables, you're going to hear the phrase well-formed formula or WFF. A well-formed formula refers to a sequence of symbols, an expression containing any combination of variables presented as letters, parentheses, and logical operators that is meant to represent formally some expression of language or thought. And so a truth table is a representation of the truth value of a well-formed formula. Now truth tables follow the principle of bivalence, which holds that true and false are the only truth values, and in every possible situation, each statement has one and only one truth value. Every statement is ultimately either true or false. So take the proposition P. With P, we have two truth values. P could be true or P could be false. So with negation, not P, we are creating another set of truth values. In this case, the truth value of not P, or it is not the case that P, is going to be opposite the truth value of the original proposition P. For example, if P is Bob is here, then it could be true that Bob is here, or it could be false. So we have two truth values for proposition P. And then for the negation of P, it is not the case that Bob is here. We have negated the truth of P, and so it's false. In the case that P was false, if we negate that, then it becomes true. It is not the case that P is false, so P is true. So with negation, we just have opposites then. If P is true, then not P is false. And if not P is true, then P is false. So the truth tables for a single variable, or the negation of that variable, are the simplest sorts of truth tables. Things become a little more complex once we add another variable. And anytime we have those other logical operators, we likely have more than one variable involved. Consider, for example, the proposition P and Q. In this case, we have a conjunction, but we have two variables. And so we have to figure out the truth value for each of those variables. Now our table becomes noticeably larger because while P could be true or P could be false, and Q could be true or Q could be false, we also have to allow for the fact that these may not line up neatly. It may not be the case that P is true and Q is true, or P is false and Q is false. So we also have to allow for the possibility that P is true while Q is false, and P is false while Q is true. Now while it is good to understand what you're doing, sometimes just memorizing the steps can help as well. So anytime you have a single variable, you're gonna have a true and then a false beneath it. Anytime you have two variables, you're gonna have two columns, four truth values deep. And you're always gonna start the first column, true, true, false, false, working from top down. And the second column, true, false, true, false. Again, you can understand what's going on or you can just memorize that. Either way, you can get to where you need to go. Now that we've taken care of the variables, it's time to address the logical operator. For a conjunction to be true, both conjuncts need to be true. If the statement is P and Q, then in any case where P is false or Q is false or both are false, the whole thing is false because the conjunction is all or nothing. I've got to have both together or I don't have a conjunction. So looking at our truth table then, in the case that P is true and Q is true, the proposition P and Q is true. But in the case that P is true while Q is false, the proposition P and Q is false. In the case that P is false while Q is true, the proposition P and Q is false. And in the case that they're both false, the proposition is false.
For example, in the proposition, Bob is here and Joe is here, that statement can only be true if it is true that Bob is here and it is true that Joe is here. Next, we have a disjunction, P or Q. In this case, we still have only two variables. So our truth table for P and Q are going to look the same. True, true, false, false for P and true, false, true, false for Q. But for our logical operator disjunction to be true, then either disjunct or both disjuncts need to be true. Remember that the or in logic is inclusive. They could both be true. At least one of them should be true. So in this case, the only time a disjunction will be false is if both of them are false. For example, I will eat an apple or I will eat a banana. If it's true I eat an apple, then it was true P or Q. If it's false that I eat an apple, but true I eat a banana, then it is true P or Q. And because the or is inclusive, if I eat an apple and I also eat a banana, then P or Q was still true. If, however, I eat no apple, I eat no banana, then P or Q is false. The conditional is a little trickier. There is no easy hint here, but remember that the consequent is the necessary condition in a conditional. Take, for example, the conditional, if it rains, then the sidewalk will be wet. If it is true it has just rained, then it will be true that the sidewalk is still wet. If it has rained yet the sidewalk is not wet, in this case P is not a sufficient condition for Q. In this case there might be something wrong with our proposition. For example it might be the case that the sidewalk is enclosed and in that case it would not necessarily follow that if it rains the sidewalk will be wet. On the other hand if it has not rained and the sidewalk is wet. This does not mean that the proposition, if it does rain, the sidewalk will be wet, is false. It might simply be a sunny day and the sprinklers came on. It may still be true that if it does rain, the sidewalk will get wet from the rain. So the fact that P is false in itself does not disprove the truth of if P then Q. Similarly, if it has not rained and the sidewalk is not wet, this does nothing to disprove the proposition. The proposition, if it does rain, the sidewalk will get wet, still holds as potentially true unless and until we've a reason to think otherwise. For the biconditional, both variables or the simple propositions need to have the same truth value. If P implies Q, then if it's true that P, it's true that Q, and if it's true that Q, it's true that P, and vice versa. The negation of P would imply the negation of Q. The negation of Q would imply the negation of P, if it's true that P, if and only if, Q. So if P is true and Q is true, then it's true that P, if and only if, Q. If P is false and Q is false, then it's still true that P if and only if Q. However, if P is true and Q is false, or if P is false and Q is true, then in each of these cases, it's false that P if and only if Q, for one of them, either the P or the Q, obtained without the other. Now sometimes we have a complex WFF or well-formed formula. And it's complex because it contains within it what we call sub-WFFs. A sub-level well-formed formula refers to a logical operator within a larger proposition. Although the proposition may contain multiple operators, the truth value of the overall proposition rests primarily upon one central operator. So in other words, we've got several operators in the mix Yet the truth value of the whole proposition rests upon just one of those operators. But the reason it is complex is because before we can get to that truth value of the overall proposition, we've got to account for the truth value of each of the individual operators.
So here are some general rules for approaching truth tables which contain complex well-formed formulas. First, the column for any well-formed formula or sub-well-formed formula is always written under its main operator. So anytime we have a proposition built around an operator, P or Q, we write the truth value beneath the operator, the OR, rather than beneath one of the simple propositions, P or Q, so that we don't confuse ourselves. Because the more we have going on, the easier it will be to get confused. Next, it will be helpful to circle the column under the main operator of the entire well-formed formula in order to show that the entries we place in that area are what is going to determine the truth value for the whole formula. As far as order of operations, we want to begin with the simplest propositions and then we want to find the truth values for the smallest sub WFFs and then use those truth tables for helping us to determine the truth value of any larger sub WFFs until we obtain the value for the whole well-formed formula. So here's an example of a more complex well-formed formula. Not only is it complex because it has multiple operators, but also because now we have more than two simple propositions in the mix. So we have to account in this case for P, Q, and R before we even get to the operators. Now, if you'll notice, we've doubled in size. When we have a single simple proposition, such as P, we only have two rows, true and false. Once we move to two simple propositions, P and Q, we've doubled to four rows. Now you will notice with P, Q, and R in the mix, our row has doubled again. Again, it will be helpful to spot the pattern. If you look at this, you will see that on the far right where R is, that from top to bottom alternates true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false. Moving to the left, the next simple proposition, Q, then goes true, true, false, false, true, true, false, false. And moving to the left to P, we now go true, 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 false, 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 false. It may be helpful to see what is going on moving from right to left. Of course, we begin on the left. So we begin with proposition P, true, 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 false, 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 false. Then proposition Q, true, true, false, false, true, true, false, false. And then simple proposition R, true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false. Now we have our truth values for our simple propositions and we're ready to move on to the logical operators. So our overall proposition, our overall well-formed formula is P and Q or R. The whole proposition hangs on the disjunction or. P and Q is the case or R is the case. So that's what we would circle that's what's going to determine the overall truth value of the well-formed formula. But before we can deal with that, we've got to look at the truth value of P and Q, the conjunction. And we know by now that a conjunction is only true if both parts are true. So there are two cases, line one and line two, that P and Q are both true. In every other case, one of them or both of them is false, so line one, the conjunction operator is true, and line two, it's true, and the rest are false. In light of that information, we can now move on to the main operator. Now here, you might want to be careful. P and Q were taken together for our conjunction. We now have the truth values for the conjunction column. And so we don't need to think about P and Q individually anymore because they do not show up individually in the remainder of our well-formed formula. Now we're looking at the conjunction P and Q or R. So we look at the column for our conjunction and the column for R in order to determine the truth value of P and Q or R. 
Now we understand by now that a disjunction is true in any case except when both things are false. So P and Q or R. In any situation in which P and Q is true or R is true or they're both true, the truth value for our main operator here will be true. And if we find a case in which P and Q is false and R is also false, in that case, on those lines, the truth value for our main operator will be false. So looking now at our truth table, line one, R is true and P and Q is true. So our disjunction is true. Line two, R is false, but P and Q is still true. So our disjunction is true. Line three, R is true, P and Q is false, so the disjunction is still true. Line four, both are false, so the truth value for our disjunction is false. And so hopefully you now see why line five is true, six is false, seven is true, and eight is false. Here's another example. P and Q or P and R, so conjunction or conjunction. In this case, once again, the disjunction, or, is our primary operator. And again, we have three variables, P, Q, and R. So we determine the truth value for those. It will look the same as it did in the last example. And then we determine the truth value for our first conjunction, P and Q. Next, we determine the truth value for our second conjunction, P and R. Once we've determined the truth value for P and Q and the truth value for P and R, then we can look at the truth value for our main operator, which is the disjunction, or, and we see that in line one, P and Q is true, P and R is true, so the overall disjunction is true. In line two, P and Q is true while P and R is false, so the disjunction is still true. In line three, P and Q is false while P and R is true. Our overall disjunction is true. And in every other case, both of them are false, which means the overall disjunction is false. Now, there are three possible configurations that we might encounter under a well-formed formula's main logical connective and each has a specific name. We are either dealing with a tautology, an inconsistency, or a contingency. In the case of a tautology, each line is true under the main operator. So in the example, either Bob is here, or it is not the case that Bob is here, P or not P, based on what we now understand concerning the truth value of the operator disjunction, you will notice that in either case, whether P is true while not P is false, or P is false while not P is true, in either case, our overall proposition remains true. Bob is here or Bob is not here. That is a tautology or something that is true in every possible situation. Next, we have an inconsistency. With the tautology, every line is true under the main operator. With an inconsistency, each line is false. For example, Bob is here, and it's not the case that Bob is here. Because we now understand that conjunctions are only true when both parts are true, it turns out that in neither situation, one where P is true and not P is false, and one where P is false and not P is true. In neither situation or neither line here does the proposition P and not P turn out to be true. In fact, to assert P and not P as true would be to assert a logical contradiction. And so the truth table here is showing us that something is wrong with the proposition P and not P it would not be true. And so if we had somehow come to the conclusion P and not P and tried to work that into a well-formed formula, there would be a serious misstep, a problem with our reasoning. 
Contingency is often contrasted with necessity. If something exists necessarily, it is necessary, then it could not have been any other way. If something is contingent, however, then it could have been different. It did not have to be the case that you were born. It did not have to be the case that Earth was formed. The existence of Jupiter is a contingent fact. It doesn't have to be here. To assert, on the other hand, that a circle can never be a square is to assert something of logical necessity. In any possible world that we might imagine, there might be a Jupiter or no Jupiter, but in no possible world, assuming we are playing fair with our terms, could there exist a square circle. As it relates to our truth tables, then, a contingent truth does not have to be, yet it could be. If something is contingently true, it could be the case, or it might not be. So in our truth table, we have a contingency when some lines are true and some lines are false. For example, if I assert it is not the case that Bob is here, the logical operator leaves us with one line that is false and one line that is true. So it is possible that Bob is here. It's also possible that he's not here. The assertion is a contingent truth, and so our truth table has contingency. Now, if we have two different well-formed formulas, and it turns out to be the case that they have the same truth value in their tables, then we can say that they are logically equivalent. Take, for example, if P, then Q, and if not Q, then not P. Now, those of you with an astute eye and a sharp memory may recall from Module 2 the modus ponens and the modus tollens. Essentially, the modus ponens says if P, then Q, we prove P to get Q, and the modus tollens says if P, then Q, and the way that we work backwards is to say Q is not the case, therefore we have reason to doubt P. These are really two forms of proving the same thing, and so they are logically equivalent. The truth value is the same for each. Take the moral argument, for example. Now, the moral argument can be stated in a number of ways, some of them quite complex. But the overall form of the moral argument is quite simple and usually takes the form of either a modus ponens or a modus tollens. Again, the phrasing can become complex. Some people lock onto evil, other people lock onto moral law, some focus on some other aspects of moral objectivity. But just using one of these examples, probably the most common way to argue is to say that a moral law requires a moral law giver. So then the modus ponens would be, if there is a moral law, there must be a moral law giver. There is a moral law, therefore there must be a moral law giver. And the modus tollens would say, if there is a moral law, there must be a moral law giver. There's no reason to believe in a moral law giver, therefore there's no reason to accept that there is a moral law. Now, while it may seem like those aren't coming to the same conclusion, in fact they are. What they demonstrate for the theist, to anyone who wants to believe that there is such a thing as moral objectivity, is that morality seems to rise and fall with the existence of God. That is, the modus ponens and the modus tollens are logically equivalent in demonstrating that if you've got an objective moral order, you must have a moral orderer or a being that created the order and will eventually distribute justice appropriately. On the other hand, if you've reason to believe that there is no such being, then you've no basis or grounding for believing there to be any real robust sense of moral objectivity. So to say that two arguments are logically equivalent just means that the truth value of each type is the same. They both have the same potential for demonstrating the same truth. Here's another example. It is not the case that P and not Q, or it is not the case that it is raining and it is not the case that the sidewalk is wet. Once we work out our table, we see that 
the overall truth value of the proposition is line one is true, line two is false, lines three and four are both true. Now compare that to the proposition, not P or Q. It is not raining, otherwise the sidewalk would be wet. When we work out this truth table, we also find lines one, three, and four are true, and line two is again false. This means that the proposition, not P and not Q, is logically equivalent to the proposition, not P or Q. So we could use either form to argue our case. Now we've talked enough about biconditionals that you should understand by now that P if and only if Q is the same as saying P leads to Q and Q leads to P. But let's use it as an example to visualize the logical equivalence and also to demonstrate that the proposition P and Q or not P and Q is also logically equivalent to the biconditional. So consider the assertion, Bob is a bachelor if and only if Bob is an unmarried man. By now we should understand how to find the truth value for the logical operator by conditional. As long as both simple propositions carry the same truth value, then the truth value of the by conditional is true. So we end up with line one true, lines two and three false, line four true. Now suppose someone instead says, if Bob is a bachelor, then Bob is an unmarried man. And if Bob is an unmarried man, then Bob is a bachelor. As we work out our truth table for the proposition if P then Q and if Q then P, we end up yet again with line one true, lines two and three false, and line four true. But if someone instead says Bob is a bachelor and Bob is an unmarried man, or it is not the case that Bob is a bachelor and it is not the case that Bob is an unmarried man. Then when we work out the truth table for P and Q or not P and not Q, we still end up with line one true, lines two and three false, and line four true. So these three different well-formed formulas are all logically equivalent. Now we've already briefly looked at much of the terminology that we will encounter in our study in propositional logic. However, if you're not familiar with it yet, you need to go ahead and start locking in some of the following terminology. First of all, let's just remind ourselves of the distinction between informal and formal logic. Informal logic is the study of particular arguments in their natural language and in the context in which they occur. So we might look at argument diagrams or study the fallacies of language or just try to dig into the definitions and make sure we understand what is being said, we are avoiding ambiguity, and we're not speaking past one another. Formal logic, on the other hand, pays close attention to the order of operations and studies the argument form or patterns common to different arguments. Since, as we've seen, the modern approach to logic is heavily symbolic, then propositional logic is formal logic. Prior to the algebraic period, however, the emphasis was on categorical logic and thinking categorically about argument form is also formal logic. We will be spending a few modules on propositional logic and then we will transition to categorical logic. So we will be camping out in the area of formal logic for several modules. Again, you've encountered this terminology already, but just to remind you of some of the terms you will encounter as you study formal logic, recall that deductive reasoning is when you reason from premises to a conclusion that is supposed to follow. A valid deductive argument is an argument whose conclusion cannot be false while all the premises are true. In other words, everything is well constructed so that if the premises are true, the conclusion will follow. So what makes an argument valid is that the conclusion does indeed follow if the premises turn out to be true. Recall that an argument can be valid even if we don't know yet whether the premises are true. If a valid deductive argument is true, that is, if the premises are true, 
and the conclusion follows, and therefore the conclusion has to be true, then it has soundness. So we say an argument is valid if the conclusion indeed follows, whether the premises are true or not, and an argument is sound if it is a valid argument that is also true. An invalid deductive argument is an argument that presents itself as good deductive reasoning, but in fact is not. Another way to say this more simply is an invalid argument is one in which the conclusion simply does not follow from the premises. Now in this module we begin to focus on propositional logic, so you should know what that is. Propositional logic is the study of the logical concept of validity insofar as this is due to the truth functional operators. That is, the logical connectives that have a consistent truth value, such as and, or, not, if, then, and, if, and only if. And then we have sentence letters, or what I've also called simple propositions, P, Q, R, etc. And these are just letter variables that stand in as placeholders for declarative sentences. So we were able to say, for example, Bob is here or Bob is not here. And we said let P stand for Bob is here, let not P stand for it's not the case that Bob is here. P is a sentence letter or a simple proposition, which we can then build upon as a well-formed formula or expand with various logical operators attached. We also looked in module two at four of the most common valid forms of propositional logic and three common fallacies or invalid forms. But now we have a working knowledge of the logical operators and so we can revisit them. And we're going noticeably deeper in the next module so it is to your benefit to go ahead and re-familiarize yourself with these so that you can just build upon them more easily as we move forward. Also recall that when you see the turnstile or the three dots that signals a conclusion, therefore. So the most common form of argumentation is the modus ponens. If P is the case, then Q is the case. P is the case, therefore Q is the case. And the modus tollens is a variant of the modus ponens where we use negation to work backwards. If P is the case, then Q is the case, not Q, therefore not P. The disjunctive syllogism comes in the form P or Q, not P, therefore Q. And the hypothetical syllogism is when we argue if P then Q, if Q then R, therefore if P then R. These are the four most common forms of valid argumentation. And because they are so popular, some of the most common formal fallacies have to do with approaching these argument forms and either disregarding the proper flow of thought or missing something about what the logical operator does or does not indicate. The modus ponens, for example, says that if P is the case, then Q follows. It says nothing of what follows if Q is the case. So to try to assert or affirm the consequent in order to prove the antecedent would be a fallacious move. Similarly, we begin with if P then Q. If Q does not obtain, then we may have reason to doubt P. However, we cannot draw from the fact that P is not the case that Q cannot still obtain if P is the case. If it rains, the sidewalk will get wet. If we find the sidewalk is not wet, this can give us reason to think it is not the case that it has rained. That's modus tollens. However, it does not follow, just because we know it has not rained, that the sidewalk cannot be wet, for the sprinkler may have been turned on. Moreover, the fact that it has not rained today 
does nothing to disprove the assertion that if it rains, then indeed the sidewalk will get wet. So with the conditional, it is fallacious to affirm the consequent rather than demonstrating that it flows from the antecedent, and it is fallacious to deny the antecedent in order to deny the consequent rather than working backwards to show that a lack of the consequent gives reason to doubt the antecedent. In the case of the disjunction, the fallacy comes from not understanding or from forgetting that the logical or is inclusive. P or Q means that P could be the case, Q could be the case, but also P and Q could both be the case. If we assume without reason an either or, that is if we assume that P or Q must necessarily mean either P or Q, then if we find that P is true, we might be tempted to conclude, therefore Q cannot be true. But if this happens, we have not really understood the logical operator we were using. Now, in the case of a tautology, P or not P, if I have reason to believe P, I can then conclude it's not the case that not P. But in the case of a true disjunction, P or Q, I cannot conclude that just because I have one, I cannot also find the other. We will learn additional argument forms or rules of inference and implication in the next module. Now, so far, we've learned how to build truth tables in order to establish the truth value of a given proposition or well-formed formula. But once you've done that, you can actually use your truth table to determine the validity or invalidity of your proposition. Once we've set our truth table up, we should see each premise individually and the conclusion at the far right. After we've constructed the truth table and determined the truth value for each column, we can then focus entirely on the columns for the premises and the conclusion, and we can look at each line in the truth table in order to determine validity. An argument is valid when, for every row where all premises are true, the conclusion in all of those rows are also true. But, if a conclusion in any one of those selected rows is false, then the whole argument is valid. At that point, it will not matter what we might have found in other rows. If there is a single row in our table where the premises are true and the conclusion is false, this means the conclusion does not clearly follow from the premises. Therefore, we are dealing with an invalid argument. Recall our definition for a valid deductive argument, an argument whose conclusion cannot be false while the premises are all true. Truth tables, then, can be quite helpful in determining whether our argument is valid or invalid. Here's an example using one of our common argument forms and common formal fallacies mentioned previously. Here we have a disjunctive syllogism. P or Q. P is not the case. Therefore, it's not the case that Q. Once we set up our table and work everything out, we end up with four lines, and we are focusing on the columns beneath our two premises, P or Q, and not P, and the column beneath our conclusion, not Q. We find that in line one, premise one is true, premise two is false, but the conclusion is true. We find that in line two, premise one is true, premise two is false, but the conclusion is false. In line four, we see that premise one is false, premise two is true, and the conclusion is false. But in line three, premise one is true, premise two is true, and the conclusion is true. This argument is valid then, because only row three has true premises, and in this row where we have true premises, the conclusion is also true. Now we've already identified that there is a fallacious disjunctive syllogism, but let's see what happens when we put it in the truth table. Here we have premise one, P or Q, premise two, P, and the conclusion is not Q. Now in this case, 
Line four, we have false, false, true. Line three, we have true, false, false. In line two, premise one is true, premise two is true, and the conclusion is true. Yet none of that matters, because in line one, premise one is true, and premise two is true, which means in a good argument, the conclusion should follow. However, the conclusion is false, which means the conclusion did not follow from the true premises, and so we have an invalid argument. Again, it does not matter that the conclusion in row two is true and the premises were true. This is an all or nothing situation where one defective row makes the entire argument form invalid. Okay, let's spend the remainder of our time putting things into practice. Let's begin by making sure we understand how to formalize our propositions. In these examples, let P stand for Paul is happy, Q stands for Quigley is happy, R stands for Robin is happy, and S stands for Sally is happy. Now, for the sake of time, I am moving on, but I encourage you to pause at this point in order to see if you can work this out for yourself and if your answer matches mine. So in our first example, we have Paul is happy, although Quigley is not. Remember, although works like but, and these things are taken together. So it's the case that Paul is happy, and it's also the case that Quigley is not. So we have P and not Q. What about Sally is not happy, or Sally is happy? In this case, the proposition should read not S or S. Paul is happy if Sally is. Now remember, if by itself signals the antecedent. So we can rearrange this. If Sally is happy, Paul is happy. So S, right arrow, P, or if S, then P. Robin is happy if and only if Sally is. In this case, it will not matter which side you put your sentence letter on. You have a biconditional. So R, biconditional, S or S, double-sided arrow, R. Neither Paul nor Sally is happy. Now, this one is a little tricky because you might hear nor and think or. However, neither nor is telling you that these two things are together. In other words, you have a set. So neither nor means this is not the case and this is also not the case. So we have a conjunction of negations. So our proposition would read not P and not S. And yet your intuition to go with or may not be far off because we will soon look at De Morgan's laws and one of them states that not P and not Q can also be expressed as not the case that P or Q. So we could say negation and then in parenthesis P or S because if both are unhappy or it's the case that neither of them is happy then it cannot be the case that either or both of them is happy. Robin is not happy if Sally is. Again, the if signals the antecedent, so if Sally is happy, then Robin is not happy. Or S, right arrow, not R. Sally is not happy, but, conjunction, Robin and Quigley are happy. So here we have not S and, then we need a parenthesis containing R and Q in parenthesis. If Sally is happy, then both Paul and Quigley are happy. So if S, both Paul and Quigley are happy. So we have S points to, or right arrow, P and Q. And P and Q need to be in parenthesis, otherwise it would suggest that P is part of the conditional, which would then make the conjunction the main operator and change the meaning of the whole proposition. Sally and Quigley are happy, but Paul and Robin are not happy. So here we can parenthesis S and Q 
and then we can parenthesis not P and not R, and then they're connected by but, which is a conjunction, so and. So overall we have S and Q and not P and not R. Now just in case you're wondering, you would not write negation sign and then parenthesis P and R to represent it's not the case that Paul and Robin are happy because this would only mean it's not the case that they are, as a set, together happy. Meaning that it could be the case that one is happy and not the other, but it cannot be the case that they're both happy. But that's not quite what this is saying. This is saying that Robin and Paul are not happy. It's just trying to convey that Paul is not happy and also Robin is not happy. Now there's a little ambiguity here since we have this coupling. Sally and Quigley are happy. Paul and Robin are not happy. It almost sounds as though we should treat them as couples or sets. In this case, if we are talking about the condition or quality of their relationship, then we're saying Sally and Quigley as a set are happy. Paul and Robin as a set are not happy. In this case, Paul might be happy with the relationship, Robin might not be, but overall their relationship is not a happy one. In that case, it would make sense to treat them as a set and negate the whole parenthesis. It's not the case, even if one person is happy within the relationship, it is not the case that they have a happy relationship. So it's not the case that as a couple, Paul and Robin are happy, not parenthesis P and R. However, while we might interpret the statement in this way, the terms that we were given for our simple propositions were individual. Robin is happy. Paul is happy. Since we were given these individual terms, we should interpret the sentence in light of that information. And if the speaker or the author wants us to interpret it differently, they should give us that information so as to avoid ambiguity. They might simply add, as a couple, Sally and Quigley are happy, but as a couple, Paul and Robin are not happy. Then we might write, parenthesis S and Q, and negation, parenthesis P and R. According to De Morgan's laws, which we will see soon enough, this is the same as saying it's not the case that P or it's not the case that R. And since we know that disjunctions are inclusive, that would mean that Paul is not happy or Robin is not happy or they're both not happy in their relationship. But I think the easiest way to write it would be parenthesis S and Q and parenthesis not P and not R. Robin is happy only if Paul and Quigley are not happy. Remember, only if signals your consequent. So we read this conditional in the order it is given. If Robin is happy, then Paul and Quigley are not happy. R, right arrow, Paul and Quigley are not happy. Now again, the language is somewhat ensnaring. What exactly is meant here? Do we mean Robin is happy if Paul is not happy and Quigley is not happy? Or do we mean Robin is happy if it's not the case that Paul and Quigley are happy? In one sense, negation, parenthesis, P and Q, what we're saying is it's not the case that they're both happy. Yet it could still be the case that one of them is unhappy while the other is happy. I don't think that's what the sentence is saying here. Robin is happy only if Paul and Quigley are not happy. In this case, it seems we are meant to take this as Robin is only happy if Paul is unhappy and Quigley is also unhappy. So while it might be tempting to say R, right arrow, negation, parenthesis, P and Q, that wouldn't really express everything that the sentence is trying to express. Better than to say R, right arrow, parenthesis, not P, and not Q. When each of them is unhappy, then Robin is happy. And finally, if Sally is happy, then either Quigley or Paul is happy. And if Sally is not happy, 
then both Paul and Robin are happy. So we see that our main operator is a conjunction. And on the left side, we have if S, then parenthesis Q or P. And on the right side, we have if not S, then parenthesis P and R. So overall, we have bracket S, right arrow, parenthesis, Q or P, in parenthesis, in bracket, and bracket, not S, right arrow, parenthesis, P and R, in parenthesis, end bracket. By the end of this module, you should be able to take a proposition such as if it's the case that not P or R, then what follows is not Q and R. And you should be able to take that well-formed formula and put it into a truth table in order to determine the truth value of each sentence letter, the negation of each sentence letter, the truth value of each logical operator that is operating as a sublevel well-formed formula in order to determine the truth value for each working premise and the overall truth value for the primary logical operator which gives you the truth value for the proposition as a whole. At that point you should be able to determine whether it is a tautology, an inconsistency, or a contingency and you should also be able to determine whether it is a valid or an invalid argument. I've gotten you started here with the truth values for the simple propositions. Pause the video and see if you can work the rest of the table out. Okay, reading from top to bottom, your column for not P should read false, 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 true, 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 true. For not Q, line one is false, line two is false, Lines three and four are true, five and six are false, seven and eight are true. For the sub well-formed formula, not P or R, line one is true, then false, true, false, true, 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 true. For the sub WFF, not Q and R, we have false, false, true, false, 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 true, false. This brings us to the final truth value for the conditional. Line one, false. Line two, three, and four, true. Lines five and six, false. Line seven, true. And line eight, false. Every line in our conclusion is not true, so we are not dealing with a tautology. Nor is every line in our conclusion false, so we are not dealing with an inconsistency. We have then a contingency. Moreover, we have two places, lines 3 and 7, where both premises are true and our conclusion is true. And nowhere in this argument is the conclusion false when the premises are true. Thus, we are dealing with a valid argument. This concludes Module 5, our Introduction to Propositional Logic. Learn well these basic moves. Take time this week to practice and familiarize yourself with the terminology because next week we dive deeper as we move on into propositional calculus. Think well, ponder long, practice as often as you can, and try to have fun doing it.